We live in a time that folks are upset about so many different things. Everywhere you look, we find uh, anxiety, worry, and frustration. When we look around the landscape in the marketplace, right now one of the things that everybody's dealing with, the school system, the military, um, uh, academia, the medical professions, and all around, we see where men and women are so anxious, so frustrated, so uh, blown out of their mind about something that they're taking their own lives at record levels or uh, medicating themselves to the point that we have an epidemic of overdoses in America today. When we look around us, we wonder sometimes what in the world is wrong with the world, and we see some of the terrible atrocities that are happening in our society. None of these things happen uh, by, by accident, and none of them are simply an anecdotal or, or they're just happening because. My, my grandfather said something years ago, and my father repeated it to me many times, and, and I'll probably say it again at some point during the course of our discourses this week. He said, you cannot plant rotten seed and then pray for crop failure. And when we think about it and we look around the landscape and we take an introspective examination of ourselves as Americans, what we have is that we've planted some rotten seeds and our crop is coming in. And it's coming in, you don't, when the Bible tells us that you reap what you sow, uh, you always reap more than you sow. You don't reap exactly. If you plant 10 seeds, you're not going to re reap 10 seeds. You're going to reap 10 plants from those seeds that are going to produce thousands or hundreds of seeds because you will always reap more, what, more than what you sow. When we leave various principles, bulwark principles, foundation principles, basic principles upon which this nation was built, and those things that we held on to when I was a child, uh, when, when I was growing up in the church, when I went to school, when we, when we leave so many of those principles and those behaviors and we change the culture that much, we see happening what we see happening today. Someone can walk up in a room and kick out a window and shoot down 58 people like they were dogs or that they were, were simply images in a shooting gallery. And, and kill, kill that many people. Someone can do it like they did in Memphis this weekend, kick in the door uh, because a lady had broke up with him and shoot the lady and her two, her two daughters, one nine and one twelve. Someone could do like some young men did when they were still in a car a few weeks ago and there was a six-year-old child strapped in the child seat on the back seat and instead of putting the child out, they turned around, put the gun in the middle of that child's head and, and took that child's life. And we have to ask ourselves, what causes this? Why, why does this happen? What brings this on? And we'll talk more about this because all of us that believe have got to be together on one thing. And that is that we trust in the Lord, his word, his way, and it is the only thing that is going to save us. And it's the only thing that's going to save this nation and save the world. Jesus made a definitive statement that all of us in this room can quote and most of us take for granted. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Now the Lord has said, get me out of the fray. Get me out of the confusion. Remove me from the chaos. Lift me up from all the anecdotes and the metaphors and the simile. Raise me up from all the cute sayings from the talking heads on TV. Move me above what the rap singers and the talk shows and all these. Uh, he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, the Lord is not just saying, go around calling his name, Lord have mercy, Lord Jesus this and Jesus that, and how you feeling blessed and highly favored. That's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is when the rest of the world is confused, when they are lost, when they don't have a clue as to which way to turn in the middle of the chaos, he said, lift me up. Tell them about me. Tell them about my word, my way, and my will. And the first thing that Christians have to do themselves is realize that they are blessed and that happiness doesn't come from the things of this world. There are so many people who are striving to be the next billionaire, the next dot-com rich person, the next person to ring the bell at the stock market. We have so many folks who these are their aspirations. This is what they want to do. But the Lord told me and you 
And you and I must understand that we are the light of the world. In the midst of the darkness, the chaos, the foolishness, the ignorance, the hatred, the meanness, the bigotry, the prejudice, and all the terrible stuff that's happening, you and I are supposed to show the difference between the holy and the profane. That's what the Lord told us to do. And we cannot take that lightly because we cannot sustain the current system. We can't build enough jails. You can't hire enough police. Everybody talks, hire more police, build more jails. You can build jails forever. Every time you lock up one knucklehead, there's 10 waiting to take his place and to do the same stuff he just did. The fact of the matter is the Lord told us, he told us, he says to each and every one of us, lay not up for yourselves treasures on this earth. As he stood on that mountain, with the Sea of Galilee behind him and the natural acoustics of that region, taking his voice to those who were listening. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, nor thieves break through and steal. And then the Lord gave us some stern advice and a great admonition. He said, where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. Every last one of us who get caught up in the foolishness of this world from time to time, and we all do, we all do. We listen to people, we get caught up in politics, whether you got a D or an R behind your name, what sorority, what fraternity, what group, what social club. The, the church is not the Mickey Mouse club. The church is not a social club. It's not a fraternal organization. It's not some fellowshipping group that gets together to network. The church has a mission, and our mission is to save the world. It's just that simple. That's our mission, to save the world. And the Lord gave us that mission. Our commander-in-chief is in heaven. He runs a monarchy, not a democracy, and he's the king, and we are his subjects. And he has given us the command to save the world. If our gospel is not preached, who's going to save the world? If we don't lift up the cross, who's going to save the world? If we're not the light of the world, if we're not the salt of the earth, if we're not the example that everybody can follow, Lord, who's going to save the world? Nobody can because you're the last man standing. Don't you get it? You're the last man standing. Everybody else is already sold out, compromised, capitulated, moonwalked away from the truth. Everybody else has already quit, given up, threw up their hands, and say you can't change anything, you sure can't change the world, and you can't make people do anything. You're the last man standing. So first of all, we have to be happy within ourselves because we are Christians because we're Christians. Everything else in our life came from God because we're Christians. Every blessing, whether you are wealthy in this room or consider yourself in poverty, none of us in poverty. You want to go some places on the planet, I'll show you poverty. Everybody in this room is comparatively rich. So the fact of the matter is we have to learn to be happy with being a Christian. Blessedness, my brothers and my sisters, is a, con a condition that results from a state of inner peace, something that's being lost in our society today. There are a lot of folks who are losing their peace. Happiness comes from two English words, hap and chance, and it has to do with external stuff. Happiness, hap, chance. You know, you may have driven a very expensive vehicle. Uh, there was a, a Sunday. Uh, I was at a church somewhere, um, uh, in, in I forget what city I was in, and, and the brother had, uh, had a very expensive vehicle. He had driven on the lot, and that, that vehicle, I'm sure, made him happy, but somebody else had broken in and was driving his happiness down the street. 
And, and he didn't see his happiness no more until the police found his happiness somewhere where they had taken the tires off of it and gutted the car, basically. We, we, our happiness is not based on hap and chance. It's not based on whether the cows come home or all ships rise or the cream comes to the top or I can name it and claim it and all that other foolishness. Our happiness is not based on that. Our happiness is based on the inner peace of knowing that I am blessed, that I am blessed. I am one that the Lord loves. It doesn't come from the whims of man and the whims of this world. Happiness involves things which we cannot always control. We can't always control what people do. Most think happiness is produced by material possession, status, position, jobs, and various networking and relationships and camaraderie. That's not what happiness is for a Christian because a Christian wants to be blessed. He wants something that is more enduring because it's not uh, based on the temporary whims of man or the temporary um, condition of the stock market or whether or not uh, our company is doing well or our job is doing well or our life is doing well outside of Christ. Blessedness is the characteristic of God himself. Because in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 11, when Paul was talking to his son in the gospel in the midst of a turbulent and terrible time, Paul was in a maritime prison in Rome. Titus had been left in Crete, and Timothy had been left in Ephesus. And as Paul is writing to these boys, both of them, he said to Timothy in his first letter, chapter 1, verses 11, according to the glorious gospel and blessed God, which was committed to my trust. He called God blessed. He used that word there because God does not change. God is immutable. God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. God is omnipresent or he is universally present. Therefore, in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 8, Jesus said something to each and every one of us that will help us change our life and not be so caught up in the goobity gop in the garbage of this world. He said, blessed are the poor in heart, the pure in heart rather, for they shall see God. There have been so many occasions when I have talked to folks over the last 50 years. There were occasions when my wife and I sat down with people and talked with them, many times young people, because she talked uh, for so long. And, and you would talk to an individual, and, and you know you're telling them what's right. You know you're giving them the scripture. You know you're giving them fatherly or motherly advice. You know you're telling them spiritually what God wants you to tell them. And they'll sit there and say, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't see it. I don't, I don't see it that way. Well, the problem is that the devil is insidious. The boy's smart. He knows what he's doing. And he can deal with each and every one of us on an individual level to make you stupid. That's why Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8, be sober, be sober, be sober, be vigilant. Keep your eyes open, dude. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, your opponent, like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. The devil's looking for a bunch of chumps that he can come and fill their head with garbage, lead them in the wrong direction, make them lies and promises that make them let go of the hand of God and follow the hand of an empty promise because he is a liar and a usurper. And I'll probably use 1 Peter 5 and 8 in every sermon that I preach because it is the basis of why we preach in the first place that we have an opponent, someone that hates your guts, excuse the expression, that hates you, can't stand you. He's already condemned to hell. Hell wasn't even made for you. He's already condemned there. And he wants you to join him because you've got something he can never have again. And that's the love, the mercy, and the forgiveness of God. God will forgive you of your sin. No matter how red and crimson they may be, God will forgive you. All God asks of you is that you repent. He can never have what he had before. 
can never have it. And he can't stand you because you can. How many of us are going to get caught up with the usurper, with the liar, the juggler? How many of us are going to have him lead us to hell, as my dad used to say in one of his sermons, for chump change? You're never going to really be a big shot sinner because you're too much of a Christian to just get on out there and act a fool. But you're always, you know, with the penny candy. You know, I remember when we were kids, uh, we'd go in the store and he had penny candy. You didn't have a nickel, but you had a penny. So you could buy those kits, you know, the little kits that had four pieces in there back in the day. I know I'm giving my age away. Or you could buy a big old Jackson cookie for a penny. And it, it was good. But it, it didn't last long. I mean, you know, there was a memory of it and taste in your mouth, you know, but it was gone. And that's what the devil wants for every one of us. The problem is that when that promise, which turned out to be a lie, is gone, there's a bitter taste in your mouth. Not the sweet taste of the Jackson cookie that I had when I was a child, but it's a bitter taste in your mouth. And this is why Peter said, be sober. Don't get drunk with pride. Don't get drunk with yourself, self-indulgence. Don't get drunk with materialism. Don't get drunk with the things of this world. Don't allow this world to make you lose your sobriety. He says, be sober. Take control of yourself. Paul said one time as he talked to the Corinthian brethren, Paul said, I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. Paul said, I bring my body under control. Paul said, because here's what I worry about. Lest while I preach to others, I myself become a castaway. In essence, I become the toss out. I become the rubbish, the garbage, the unapproved, the unacceptable, while I have preached to others. You know, brothers and sisters, I tell folk everywhere I go, don't go to hell through the church. Don't make the church your conduit to condemnation. If you're going to be a Christian, be a Christian. Act like one. Think like one. Talk like one. Carry yourself like one. Be genuine. Be for real. The devil's looking for fakes. He can smell them a mile away. And he's looking for people who want something other than what the Lord offers. He's looking for folks who want the lie. And the facade, Paul said, having the form of godliness. In other words, like a mannequin, got a form, but there's no life there. A form of godliness, but denying the power therein. In essence, brothers and sisters, we have to find within ourselves the means, the ability to be happy that I am a Christian, that I'm a Christian, that I'm a child of God that I wear the name of the Son of God, that I'm going to pattern myself after the life of the Son of God, that I'm going to live in such a way that he can look down upon me and be proud of what I have done and I, how I have lived. So he said, be sober, be vigilant, keep your eyes open. Don't go blind. Don't go blind. And how many people go blind? They can't see. They can't understand and perceive where they are and what's going on in their life until it is too late. You and I have a command to endure because only those who endure are blessed. Endurance is uh, present active, basically meaning that that individual has patience, that individual stands, that, inv that individual will not fail the test. The person who endures is the person who patiently submits himself or herself to the trials of life, to the furnace of fire that comes, to the test that proves each and every one of us that that faith strengthens their character and makes them better. Every time I marry a young couple, and I've married hundreds over the last 50 years, when they stand there before me and the young man, big-eyed, looking at his beautiful bride, and the beautiful bride uh, looking at her, her husband, I take those rings in my hand. Uh, my finger's getting fat. Can't hardly get it off anymore. 
my, and I hold those rings in my hand right in their faces. And I say, look at these rings. I said, what you've given me in our culture, and I take the lady's ring and the man's ring. Hers is usually much prettier with more stones and stuff. I said, and this is one that my wife bought me after 40 years, so I promise you I didn't have nothing this fancy for a long time. But anyway, be that as it, as it may, I say, the, in our culture, this is what we've chosen as a symbol of our love and our devotion. We've chosen rings for several reasons. This ring has no beginning and no ending. It is an endless circle. It begins and it continues because it's a ring. And so should your love be. It should be that way. Then I say that the metal in this ring is a precious metal. I said it has shined because it has gone through the fire. The fire burned away the impurities, the dross. It's all gone. And what was left after it went through the fire, the fire didn't destroy the metal. The fire purified the metal and made it beautiful. Then I say that the, the stone, usually a diamond, is the hardest substance known to man. I said you can't crush it. You can't destroy it. You can't break it. So should your love be. Think about it. Our love should be equally enduring for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He didn't give up on us. He could have quit on us. He didn't quit on us. He didn't give up on us. He didn't walk away from us. Our only salvation was that that boy, that young man in his early 30s got up on that cross and died after being beaten like a dog all night long. That's all we had. That was our only hope. And he didn't give up on us. So should our love be an endless circle. No beginning and no ending. It doesn't matter what life brings. Doesn't matter how hard it gets. It doesn't matter how many times the company moves, the factory moves, the job leaves. It doesn't matter how many times we stand in a six by four hole in the ground and cry our hearts out. It doesn't matter what life brings. I hold on to him, and I never let go. I never let go. That's what a Christian does. A Christian goes through the fire. The fire doesn't destroy us. It doesn't make us fall to our knees. How dare we fall to the knees before the devil and his angels? But it, the fire makes a Christian strong and purified. It shows and reveals a strength that they didn't even know they had. And they're willing to look the devil dead in his eye. And as Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's what happens to a Christian. A Christian never is crushed, never is broken. The apostle Paul says, I've been caned, I've been whipped, I've been stoned, I've been snake bit, I've been shipwrecked. He says, I have gone through it. But Paul says, no matter what happens to me, none of these things move me. A Christian can't be crushed. They endure to the end because Christ endured for us. I tell people this all the time, and I will say this again during the course of this week. If dying for me was the most he could do, living for him is the least I could do. And every one of us from time to time need to look within ourselves and ask myself, am I steadfast? Am I unmovable? Am I rock solid? Am I rooted? Am I grounded? A tree is rooted. A building is grounded. Am I one of those people who no matter what happens, I stand? The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 to the brethren that every one of you can quote. He said to the brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Unmovable. That's a very powerful concept. That is a very powerful statement that no matter what comes in life, I stand with the Lord. I stand with Jesus and I shall not be moved. When Christians are thinking properly, they understand this about their trials. Hear the truth about trials, because I am a Christian. 
Because I'm a Christian, I understand that everybody has trials. Trials are common to all people. The New Testament writer says, don't act like some strange thing is happening to you. Because it's not. Everybody's got trials. My big mama used to say, you got troubles, I got troubles. You got a story, I got a story. All God's children got a story. All of us got a story. Every one of us could stand up in here right now and tell a story that would break us down into tears. Every one of us could. We all have had heartbreak. All of us have lost those that we love dearly. Every one of us have had those moments when we didn't feel like we were going to make it and we had to drop to our knees and ask the Lord to pull us through. Every one of us have had those moments when we had to say, you know what? That was nothing but the Lord. That was nothing but the Lord. Because otherwise, I would not have made it through. Trials are coming to all of us. All of us are going to have trials. The test of a man is not his trials. What does he become after those trials? When those trials are over, who is he now? What is he like now? Is he better or is he bitter? Too many of us, our trials leave us bitter, angry at the world. We got so many people out there in the world right now, they're angry and don't know who they're angry at. Don't know what they're angry about. All they know is they're angry. And that aggression is played out in the marketplace in man's inhumanity to man. What else about our trials? They must be endured. They must be endured. When we read about our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, who knew no sin, Neither was guile found in his mouth. Jesus lived the life. He didn't just talk it. He lived it. And though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. We must endure. We can't quit. We can't quit. Where is quitting in the scripture? Where is quitting when we read about Stephen? Where is quitting when we read about John on the island of Patmos? Where is quitting when we read about James with a sword going in his belly and coming out of his back? Where is quitting when we read about Peter crucified upside down, as the historians say? Where is quitting when we see Stephen standing there preaching until they beat him down with stones? Where is quitting when Christians were fed to the lions like dog meat in the Colosseum of Rome? How dare we actually believe? That we can sit down on the seat of do nothing, lean back on the elbows of do less and say, wake me up when the fight is over. You're a Christian. The Lord recruited you. You didn't volunteer. He recruited you. He called you and he put you into battle. And he expects every last one of us to stand no matter what. What else do we know about our trials? When successfully born, when you successfully stand, when you successfully look the devil in his old ugly red eyes and say, I will not follow you the way the Lord did. Why don't you look at you, boy? You're a mess. So look at you, hungry. You hadn't eaten in 40 days. Turn those stones into bread. Impress me, boy. Impress me. Jesus says, I'm not going to do it. He says, there are more important things in life than bread. You don't live by bread alone. Took him to a high mountain. Why don't you jump off this mountain? Just jump off because it seemed like I read somewhere that, that the angels will come and, and will take care of you and won't even let your feet hit the rocks. Why don't you just jump off. Impress me, boy. Impress me. Jesus says, you don't play with God like that. You don't play with God. How many people every day get up and play with God and dare God to take their life before they repent, before they change, before they alter and get their lives right? Jesus says, no, you don't tempt God. You don't play with God like that. Why don't you bow down, boy? Bow down. Just bow. Look at all that stuff out there. I can give you all that stuff. I can give you your heart's desire. I can make you rich and wealthy and powerful, give you position. You're just a little old nobody from Nazareth, a carpenter. Just imagine with your talent and my leadership who you could be in this world. Jesus says, no, you don't worship nobody but God. I will not bow down to you. 
The devil's going to approach every one of us with those same temptations because they have worked since the beginning of time. John gave us a synopsis of the devil's whole arsenal. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, John said. He said, let me break it down to you. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. He said, that's it. That's all the devil got. He doesn't need anything else because it's been working since Adam and Eve. It's been the most successful campaign in the history of man. And the devil, therefore, has become the greatest mass murderer in the history of mankind. Because everybody that dies, dies because of his first and most diabolical lie. You will not die. So John says, that's all it is. Jesus was the first man in the history of the world, the first human being, the first person to say no to all three his entire life, his whole life. He never yielded to the lust of the flesh. His whole life, he never yielded to the lust of the eye. His entire life, he never yielded to the pride of life. Jesus endured. And because of this, he's a fit perpetuant. His perpetuation for you and me was successful because Jesus remained perfect humanity and perfect divinity. And this morning, how much more time I have? Ten minutes, okay. And this morning, each and every one of us, we have to look within ourselves. Every now and then, I have to do a checkup from the neck up, as they say. Every now and then. Because my dad used to say, boy, your head swollen so big, it'd take a crowbar to get you in the house. And, and I would understand that when he would say stuff like that to me, he's telling me I've gotten out of my place, that I think I knew more than I knew. And I I think I understood more than I understood. And he would let me know that I was headed for a train wreck and that I had to change. The Apostle Paul, who endured, Jesus had had already told us and and gave us some good uh, information. In the book of Matthew, chapter 10, and verses 22, he said, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. The Lord said, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that folks are going to like you because you are a Christian. Problem with a lot of us is that's what we expect. We expect folks to like us because we do right, because we conduct ourselves right, because we don't do anything to other people. We, We keep to ourselves. We try to obey the Lord. And many of us actually believe that because we conduct ourselves as a child of God, that people are going to like us. The Lord said, that's no, it's just the opposite. They hated me first, and they're going to hate you because they hated me. The apostle Paul said to the brethren through Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 10, Paul said, therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus in eternal glory. The Apostle Paul is basically saying, I am doing everything I can to help you get to heaven. One time Paul says, I'm in a straight betwixt two, if you please. He says, I would love to go home. It's hard out here. Paul says it's hard. The stuff I go, for us to actually believe that the Apostle Paul and Jesus and James and Peter and in our imagination carry them on like cartoon characters, like superheroes of the movie, like they didn't really believe that bleed. They didn't really sweat and were hungry and tired, that they didn't suffer. Persecution was not real to them, that the trials and tribulations that you and I go through didn't pull on them also. These men suffered, and they suffered egregiously, but they refused to quit. Because they were trying to go to heaven. They understood something. You can't stay here. This is not home. So they wanted to go home one day. Paul says, I would love to go home. But for me to stay here is better for you. When you endure, Paul gave us the formula for endurance in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And real quickly, beginning with verses 10, 
he tells us how we can endure. He said, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience, persecution, affliction, which came to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystria, which persecution I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Notice what Paul said. That word endure comes from a Greek term which basically means to remain under. You don't quit. You don't give up. You don't compromise. You don't lay down and die when the Lord needs you to stand and speak and endure. Understand something. When Peter was there in the garden with the Lord, the Lord, all the Lord needed them to do was stay awake with him for a little while and be comforting to him. That's all he needed. When they came to get the Lord, Peter grabs a sword and whacks off somebody's ear. The Lord said, put that thing down before they kill you. You're not a swordsman. You're a fisherman. Put the ear back on the man. And the Lord told Peter, if you live by that, you die by that. All the Lord needed for Peter to do was stand there, drop his hands, not move, stand behind him, and look the Romans in the eye and say, I'm not scared of you. If you chop me down right now, I'm still not scared of you. If you run me through with the sword, I'm going to stand with Jesus all the way. That's all the Lord needed from Peter. He didn't need anybody to fight. He could have called a thousand angels to fight. What he needs for us sometimes is to let the world know we're not afraid of you. There is nothing that you can take from us that will make us renounce Jesus. There's nothing you can do to us that will make us leave his church. There's nothing that you can say about us that will make us stop calling ourselves Christians. That's what the Lord needs from us at this day and time. He needs for the world to know that I've got some people who are not scared of you, not afraid of you, who won't quit no matter what you do. So the Apostle Paul said, here's how you endure. Paul said to the brethren, the formula is this. Endurance takes a combination of these manners, purpose, that which is set before him, faith, he talked about steadfastness, long-suffering, the ability to maintain your integrity no matter what, no matter what, charity, love for your Lord, for your brethren, and Lord, love for yourself, love yourself enough to save yourself, patience to remain under. Paul said, if you do these things, you'll make it through trials, and you won't quit whole lot of people say, well, Paul was so strong, that's why he endured. No, you're absolutely wrong. Paul was not, didn't, didn't endure because he was strong. Paul was strong because he endured. When you endure, you become strong. When you endure, you become strong. Every time you lift a weight, your muscles get stronger. You may start with five pounds and you may go to 10 and the 15 and 20 and eventually you're pressing some folks more than your body weight because your body has endured and strengthened over a period of time. The apostle Paul didn't endure because he was strong. He was strong because he endured. And every time he said no to quitting, to giving up, to being afraid, to being fearful, to desiring the things of this world over the things of the Lord, to walking away from his commitment, to stop preaching. Every time he said no, he became stronger to the extent that this man could do a deaf walk like probably nothing the Romans had ever seen other than Jesus. This man could walk to Nero's chopping block. And see a basket there with blood all over it. And a man probably 6'3", six, 6'4", six, or taller or bigger, two, 300 pounds, with a blade that's about this long on a 10-foot pole that he expertly could wield, who had probably just cut somebody's head off, and they had lifted it up for the crowd and thrown it away on a wagon. And here comes Paul with his clothes matted, to his body with his beard matted emaciated 
skin cracked and terrible, hair matted, eyes red, tongue swollen because that prison was an awful, awful, awful place. And this man could walk, looking at that man standing there with that blade, looking at that basket with the blood all over it, looking at that indention where he put his head down the chopping block and his shoulder comes over the, his neck and, and chin comes over the other side. And he can walk and say, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I'm not doing them in order. I have finished my course. No matter what happens when you leave this world, you better be able to say, I finished it. I finished it. Every one of us. Think about that. Thank you.